great expectation was summed up in four S's. Great expectation in terms of skills. Are the next generation skilled enough to take over the business? Great expectations in terms of scale. Do they have the place in the business? The great expectation in terms of uh, succession. Is, a, is the succession a process? Is it more than just an event of handing over the control of the business from the founding members to the next generation? And the next S is the stakeholders. The increasing importance of stakeholders across businesses. The first slide talks about earning their stripes. Now, when you talk about family businesses, the assumption is that you get shoved into a position that you don't even deserve. But in the survey, surprisingly, more than 50% of the respondents started from a very junior role and rose up to become board levels. Only 5% were immediately pushed up to the board level, and only 6% were immediately pushed up to the senior management level. And that's a very interesting fact, meaning for most of these next generation business leaders, they have the proper training on the job coaching that they need for them to take over the reins of the business. But that's globally. If you split the population, say, the Asian culture, which is more traditional, the percentage is actually reversed. In Asia, and specifically in the Philippines, for family businesses, Younger generations and next generation leaders are immediately pushed up to the top. They start at a very senior position and then they just wing it until they make it, which contributes to more than 70% of all family business failures nationwide. It's the lack of proper succession planning. So if you are a family member, how are you treated in the family business? Were you given special attention? And these are the results of the survey. Clear career path, 42%, very good. I have not been given any preferential treatment, 50%, which is also good. That means that when you work from a very junior role, you really did some work, meaning you're not just there to fill in the numbers. What else? I'm properly appraised, even though I'm a family member. Later on, we'll talk more about that. But of course, as expected, 69% of them said it can be very difficult to separate home from work. Your boss is your dad. And it contributes to the last part, which means being a family member. I have to work even harder to prove myself to the company. 88% of the surveyed next generation family business leaders said they felt that they needed to work extra hard just because they are family members. Now, family members, of course, for family businesses, one of the distinctions is that you build your business for generations to come. And sometimes, the view of the founding family members is different from the views of the next generation leaders. So we ask these next generation leaders, What's your future role as you envision in the company or in the business? 32% of them said, well, I know that someday, somehow, some way, I will be managing the business. But it's not yet been agreed. When? How? And I was uh, talking to, uh, to a couple of delegates at the back who are uh, themselves part of a family business, that succession is an issue more of the founding generation rather than the incoming generation. It's the separation anxiety from the founding members letting go of the reins and letting the next generation leaders uh, take over the, the business. 28% uh, said, I expect to be managing the company one day, and this has been agreed, and this is the ideal situation. But that's 28%. Only one-third of all those next-generation leaders are prepared to take on that job. Now, if they are taking over the business, what are the key things that these next-generation leaders would like to implement? 
You know, the, the founders may have built the business from scratch. It's a mom and pop store. They are the entrepreneurs. They are the inventors. They are the sales managers. They are the HR people. They run the business by themselves. But it's time for the next generation to come in. And next generation means new ideas, new markets, new locations. And these are the top four things that next generations would like to implement. One, bring in experienced non-family members. You know, for the founding members, founding members of the family, it's very difficult for them to trust an outsider. You know, for family businesses, familiarity over competence. They'd rather have someone they know than someone who they don't know, but they are sure that that guy or girl will know what he's doing. Familiarity over comp competence. And, and this is changing with the next generation because the next generations are going to professionalize the organization. They will bring in professional managers. And by bringing in outsiders, it's going to be a totally different ballgame. It's good. It also has uh, its consequences. Next, take the new business to new geographic markets. Now the, the, my favorite story about this one is, uh, is uh, about a coconut juice business in uh, Fiji. They have a family business that uh, package coconut juice and sells traditionally to the markets in Fiji, New Zealand, and, uh, and Australia. And it's not a, a, a bad business. It's actually a very, very good business. Every year, they're registering 5 million Australian dollars in, in revenue. And for that business model, it's already considered a good size. Now, the next generation came in and took over the reins. 17-year-old lady who is still going through university. She tied up with Alibaba. And now she's exporting their coconut water to China and the rest of, uh, and the rest of Asia. Guess how, how, how much are they making now? From 5 million Australian dollars, in two years' time, she was able to grow the business to 56 million Australian dollars without any capex whatsoever, without hiring additional people whatsoever. The power of technology, the power of new ideas, the power of new location. And then 59% of them said diversify into new products. Now, this is a bit debatable because traditional family businesses will have their own traditional products. Jägermeister is a good example and a classic example. They've been in the business for more than 300 years and they only have one product, Jägermeister. You all know what uh, Jägermeister is. The only variant that the new generation introduced, the size, the packet size, Jägermeister. But otherwise, it's the same product. It's still Jägermeister. And they are successful at that. So number three is debatable. So stick to your core competency and make sure that when you venture into new product, new location, make sure that you are able to succeed. And the last one is new entrepreneurial venture to run alongside, meaning they are diversifying and trying to exit maybe an IPO, welcoming a potential partner, a venture capitalist into the business, and so on and, uh, and so forth. That's part of the exit strategy. If those are the big things, and I alluded to this a while ago, digital is one of the most important aspects that's going to change a lot of businesses in the next five to 10 years. Pay attention to what's going to happen in the next 10 years, they said, because it's going to influence what will happen in the next 100 years. The technology, I'm sure you have listened to the technology guys earlier, and, and, and just the sheer amount of innovation that came in over the last three to five years, unimaginable, unimaginable. You look at Uber and you look at Airbnb and how they have disrupted the transportation and the hotel and, and, and entertainment industry. But I'm not talking about a disruptive technology. While most family businesses, especially the current generation or the founding generation, they talk about technology and its disruptive effects. The next generation are looking at technology 
as a catalyst, as a springboard to prepare, to prepare their business to, uh, to greater heights. 47% said they have discussed the threat, but that's about it. Discussion of the threat. How about the opportunities? You look at 41% that said, I believe the business strategy or the business as a strategy fit for the digital world. Or believing into something is different from actually making it fit, future-proofing your business. 37% uh, is the classic scenario. I struggle to get the business to understand the importance of a clear digital strategy. And 29% uh, said family businesses tend to be slower in keeping with technological advances. Now this is the story of the next generation. There are a few slides um, in terms of the, the global trends and transformation, what is important to the next generation versus the current generation. Uh, I think something's messed up on the, on the slide. Um, similarly, in terms of top three business priorities, but I'd like to highlight the following. The seven golden rules for ambitious next gens coming out of the survey. Number one, try before you buy. And, and this applies not only to gadgets and, and stuff. This also applies to the role that you're going to play in the organization. You know, especially going into the family business, you give it a try. Maybe you do an internship, just a short-term stint, just so you can get an understanding, a feel of the culture, the environment, the people that you're going to work with. And then go out and have real experience in the outside world really understanding what is required in your business and go back with that experience, go back with that skills, training that you've gotten from outside world, that's the best of both worlds. Next, only take a role you're suited for. We've discussed this. You know, traditional businesses, if you are the only son or daughter of the president, then by default, you will be the president. But what if you are not suited to be the president of that company? What if you are not able to perform that function? Remember, it's not just you. It's also the legacy of your family. Because whatever happens to your reign will determine the continuance or discontinuance of your family business. I have one client, and they are into garments. And uh, he was telling me, I'm an old guy, Aldi, turning 75 next year. My kids don't have any interest in running my business. Should I just sell my business? And I told him, if you sell now, you'll get a good money, good amount of money. Maybe you can give it to your children. You can, you can sell it for probably 3 billion, 3.5 billion max. You have three children. One billion each. Not a bad life to hand over to your children if they don't have interest um, in, in your business. But one billion pesos nowadays for someone who doesn't know how to run a business, give them a year and that one billion is gone. So I was telling my client, you can sell, you will have the money. But more than selling the business is ensuring the lasting legacy of your family. Your business was handed over to you by your father, inherited from your grandfather and from his great-great-grandfather. That's six generations of families venturing into, into this business. Are you going to let that end? And uh, good thing he listened, he still uh, kept his business. He professionalized his business. The children are out. Uh, of the business. They are uh, getting dividends from their shares, of course, living the life, but still the legacy of the family business continued. Next, insist on proper appraisal. Appraisal is a, is a, is a good thing because it helps you identify your blind spots. And as young leaders, it's more important for us to know where we are lacking rather than where we are sufficient at. Next, handle change with care, especially when you're dealing with the founding members who are not only resistant to change, but uh, change was never a part of their vocabulary. 
Communicate, communicate is, uh, is another thing. Upwards and downwards. And then this is the one I alluded to earlier. Make sure that succession is a process and not just an event. And more importantly, and the most important part of the seven golden rules, enjoy it. And I don't have to tell you how to enjoy yourselves. I'm sure you, you have your own ways of enjoying. Um, so have it and enjoy it. And at this point, that's the cue for my uh, very short story. I only have five, uh, five minutes. And uh, Richard introduced me earlier as someone who's coming from the north. Graduated from a very small university, only one school in the whole country. Uh, probably a population about, of about uh, 50 students, the whole college. And uh, I am a farmer's son. And if you think of the life of a farmer as hard, imagine a farmer without a farm. Because that's the family that I grew up with. My father tended to the farms of other people and got very little for it. Barely enough to uh, put food into our uh, table. So by design and circumstances, I am not meant to be here. I am bound to fail. I have nothing with me. I don't have any possessions growing up. We don't have any luxury going up, growing up. And even st studies, it's, it's very difficult to get by. But my father is a very, very proud man. At a very young age, he made sure that my life is outside of that little barrio where I grew up in. Every night when he came home from, uh, from the farm, he, lets me, he let me uh, hold his hand, very rough and callous hand, and whisper to me, you deserve better. You deserve something bigger. He made sure that his job is to farm, and my job is to study. Now, I went to school, public school, all the way up. And my classmates will have all the gadgets and the books, encyclopedia at the time. And I only have my sheer will. I probably have the most used library card in the history of our school. Because what I lack in books and what I lack in tools, I compensate with maximum efforts. I'm in the library every single hour that, uh, that I don't have class. And I read books, not related to my subjects. I read travel and adventure books. And those books gave me a new world, a different world. As early as high school, my father sent me to a dormitory. I went to a high school which is less than two kilometers from my barrio. I don't have to live in a dormitory. But he let me stay in the dormitory so that I will be exposed to a different world. Because my father believed that if I stayed in that barrio, I will develop that small time mentality and I will be satisfied with whatever I had then and not aim for something bigger. And that's the wisdom of my father. He let me experience the world outside and he made sure that I am destined to be bigger, to be better. And he asked me to study harder and study harder and study some more because I am not a good farmer. And if I don't finish my studies, I will die in hunger. And that's why high school and college, I, uh, I really exerted effort maximize my effort and study the art. While my friends and my classmates played and enjoyed, I studied. And then uh, when I graduated, and I graduated by means of uh, grants, scholarships, and the uh, good graces of my, of my relatives, when I graduated, I told my dean who became my mentor that when I make it to the board exam, I will come back and share my lessons and share my, uh, my learnings to the students of this university. So I went to Manila, first time to travel to Manila for the review school. Two weeks before the board exam, another disaster struck. I contracted dengue. 
late stage dengue. And I had to do blood transfusion two weeks before the exam. So I, my, my reviewers at the time are telling me, oh, you should postpone your exam. Take the next batch. Sayang, the chance for you to, uh, to, uh, to top the board exam. And I said, I don't have the money anymore to stay six more months in Manila for review school. So I went from the hospital bed straight to PUP where I took my uh, board exam with two dextros on my arms, riding a jeepney, imagine that, from uh, PSBA in, uh, in Manila, riding a jeepney all the way down to PUP Santa Mesa, and I took the board exam. It's really a painful experience. I don't know if you can imagine, but it's very, very painful. So I took the board exam nonetheless, and fortunately for me, not only did I make it, I was one of the top notchers of the CPA board examination. Thank you. And I made good on my promise. I went back to my uh, alma mater in the province, and I taught for three semesters. And I was getting settled, and I, I said to myself, I'm, I'm happy with this life. You know, I, I grew up with, uh, with nothing in, in terms of possession of value. So I'm already satisfied with this one. And then my dean mentor did something that is unthinkable. He fired me from the university. You know what he said? I have to fire you, Aldi, because you have to go back to Manila and you have to try for the bigger things and bigger aspirations. So I joined PwC. So I was uh, uh, first time to, uh, to be in Makati, so I don't know where, uh, where I was uh, going, going at the time. I went for an interview. I found a match with the, uh, uh, with the career that I'm, I'm planning to take. And fortunately for me, training is a big thing in PwC. And I like learning because I don't have the tools. I don't have the gadgets, but I learn fast. And uh, just to give you an idea, I play all kinds of sports. Even those sports that are unheard of in, uh, in the Philippines. I play cricket, I play squash, because I learned it when I was posted in, uh, in the UK. So two years after joining PwC, I was sent to the UK for secondment. That was my first flight ever. Imagine coming from a barrio of no more than 100 people and then going to the UK and join an office with 70,000 headcount. Just one office, just one office. So I did what I do best, to study faster than the others and to adapt faster than the others. After my two years economy in the UK, went back to the Philippines, did my time, did my studies in the AAM, get sent to the, to the US for further studies for a course sponsored by PwC with the uh, INSEAD and Harvard. And they told me at that time, you can make partner in 14 years. I did it in 10 years. And I'm not saying this to brag, but if you grow up with nothing to lose, you have everything to gain. Maximum efforts, maximum efforts. And I, and, and I am always asked, you know, how did I make it? I, I, I'm happy where I am now, but I think I can still do better. And people ask me, how did I make it? And I always tell them, I go back to the advice given to me by, by, by my father. He said, and he told me at a very young age, never ever have a backup plan. Because what backup plans do is to give you a safe haven when you fail. So he told me, think about what you want to do in life and dedicate all your efforts, all your strengths, and all your resources towards achieving that objective and you will never ever need a backup plan. So that's how I have always been. I'm given a challenging assignment. Now I'm uh, heading the branch operations of PwC. And Richard mentioned that I'm leading the project called Building Better Vismin. And it's actually part of our advocacy to draw up investments and opportunities towards Visayas and, uh, Visayas and Mindanao. Young leaders, if you must invest, you first have to invest in yourself. 
Because if all else fails, you still have yourself. And you can only pick up where you are standing now. It doesn't matter how you started. You know, my life is not a glamorous life. You know, I can tell you how I grew up in, in that very small barrio. My life was never easy. But easy is for the faint-hearted. You know, as leaders, we need to be challenged. Just as much as gold, it has to go through fire for it to be purified and for it to achieve uh, the brilliance that it should have as uh, a thing of value. So if there's one thing that I can leave you for this afternoon, is that nothing, nothing, nothing substitutes the good old-fashioned hard work. You can have all the tools and the gadgets in the world, but without hard work and dedication and sheer will to succeed, you can only go so far. So thank you for having me this afternoon. I hope uh, you learned a thing or two. Thank you.